Hello, Revive family. My name is Vanessa Cruz, and I'm excited to continue on this series called Temptations. We have been unwrapping the story in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 10, on the temptations of Jesus. And last week, we got to really discuss um, the temptations of appetite. And just this idea that Jesus was tempted by um, an immediate response for his own physical needs. And today we are going to discuss the temptation of applause. Um, I'm going to read with us Matthew 4, 1 through 10, just kind of as a recap. And it says this in verse in chapter 4, verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones, stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right there, we found out last week, and as you read that story, that Jesus didn't fall for the temptation to meet his own needs, but perhaps he would be willing now to stage a miracle to meet the expectations of others. And so in Matthew 4, 5 through 7, where we are going to unwrap this temptation, it says this, Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. We see here that the devil tempted Jesus with doing something that will be self-promoting and to gain an emotional high from others' applause and praise. You see, the devil told him to jump off from the highest temple and have angels protect him and prove that you really are the Son of God, that you really are who you say you are. Then everyone will approve. You see, what the enemy was doing here at church was that he was flipping the script of when you get the applause and the praise, then you will find worth. In a sense, then you will know who you are. And that is a lie of the enemy. You see, the enemy was twisting us to understand that our emotional stability should be rooted in others and not in who God is. So the the temptation for applause is essentially the temptation to do what is necessary to be liked by people or by a specific person. So the challenge for us as we understand the temptations of Jesus, as we now look through the lens of Jesus and what that looks like in our lives is to ask ourselves the question, what are we willing to lay at the altar of personal praise and human affirmation? What are we willing to sacrifice to be liked by people? You see, some of us, if we're honest, are willing to engage in sin, to engage in things that aren't life-giving for the sake of a friendship, for the sake of a relationship, for the sake of a job. Some of us might even go further and we might steal, we might even cheat, we might engage in substance abuse. We might cut corners. For others, we might even step on others to climb the ladder of success. Unfortunately, we see that nowadays more than ever that we are willing to go back to someone's past in order for them to bring them down and for us to move ahead. We're willing to expose the ugly truth of other people's lives in order for me to move forward and for me to be liked and for me to be praised and for me to be applauded. And let's take it further for some of us that have been following Jesus for a while. We are willing to appear to be pious, to be holy, to be perfect in order to be revered and all the while filled with so much pain and dissatisfaction in our lives. Matthew 6 warns us of this. Matthew 6, 1, 2, it says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Again, 
Scripture is warning us to not fall into the temptation of applause because the applaud and the praise is all you will get. That is the full reward. And if we know any better, we understand that just an applause and just the praise that we can get from men is only temporary. It's not eternal. You see, Alicia Britt-Sholey, as we have been um, looking in her book, and that's where we have gotten this series out of, and in the book Anonymous, it, she says, longing for human affirmation in itself is not sinful, but living for the longing is both self-serving and short-sighted. I love that she says that because, can I be honest, um, I will be the first one to admit that the applause and the praise is something that I definitely sometimes um, like and it feels good. And so I, just so you know, like it's okay to want the applause and the praise. However, what Alicia says so eloquently, she says, but living for the longing is both self-serving and short-sighted. You see, there's a difference between, yes, wanting the applause and the praise, but, but there's a difference between wanting it and living for it where our whole world and our whole life and everything, all our decisions and everything we decide to do is for the sake of applause and praise of other people. You see, human favor is both fickle and fleeting, Alicia Britt-Sholey says in her book. But the thing is, is that at some point, the praise and the applause of others becomes what we are living for, so much that when it does not happen, we beat ourselves up, and this is when we become slaves to the applause of other people. Because we have believed that the lie that if we are applauded and praised, we are loved and we are known. It's crazy what people will do to gain the ad admiration, the applause from the world and culture and how it can become completely acceptable when there's no knowledge of an almighty, faithful, and unwavering love that, that is accessible to us. And that love that is not fickle and temperamental or dependent on, def on performance on what we do. So as believers, as followers of Jesus, what can we do to not fall into the temptation of applause, to not fall into the temp temptation of praise of others? What can we do? You see, the antidote isn't don't do it. Because again, like I said, we're human. Rather, it is to know that I am cherished and loved by God. And what could a human applaud add to that? If we can begin to shift our perspective to understand that we are fully cherished and fully known and fully loved by the God of the universe and the God that created you and I, then there's no human applause or no human praise or no human um, okay or you know affirmation that will add to who we are. If anything, that's just the flow of everything. You see, in Forbes magazine, there's an article about peer pressure in the world of business. In this article, it points out how problematic it can be when a group of individuals sit around a table and are in a meeting, and they are discussing, discussing a great idea. But there is one person who can see the greatness, but also the pitfalls and the risk of this idea that perhaps other people do not see. And unfortunately, in this article, it says that per that person might feel like speaking up is dangerous because they will not be applauded. And often, they don't speak up. In this article, David Maxfield says, the quiet, polite expression of doubt can turn the rest of the group from zombies into thinkers. He said, the quiet, polite expression of doubt can turn the rest of the group from zombies into thinkers. I love the picture of turning groups from zombies into thinkers. If you think about it, Jesus was this person. Jesus turned zombies into thinkers. The religious leaders were zombies. They were doing whatever it was that made people applaud them and praise them because of what they were doing on the outside. But like we know, Jesus challenges the religious leader. Would you take a look on what's on in the inside? You see, the temptation of applause can cause us to be like zombies. 
But what if the antidote in this world is your quiet response of, I don't know that I need to do that just so that you could like me because I'm already loved. But rather, it's me willing to speak up, to live in such a way that goes against the applause and the praise of man, but the applause and the praise of the God who created you and I. Could it be that we are called to be the ones to turn our circles of influence from zombies, just doing whatever everyone else is doing, the praise and the approval, the follows, the likes, the, the posts, the what you didn't post, what you did post, into thinkers? Could it be that you and I, Revive Church, are called to turn our circles of influence from zombies to thinkers? When you understand that you are the center of God's delight, nothing can compete with the excitement, the joy of knowing you are loved and cherished by our Creator, our Lord and Savior. There's a story in the Bible on the prodigal son. Many of us might know it and many of you might not. And I would encourage you to read it in Luke 15, 11 through 32, but I'm going to summarize it. And pretty much it's about a man who has two sons, a younger son and an older son. The younger son asked for his inheritance early. And as soon as he got his inheritance, the Bible tells us that the younger son gathered all the things that he had and went with his inheritance and went and squandered his wealth in wild living. He left his father's home and did whatever it is he wanted to do. And the Bible then tells us that there is a severe famine and the younger son decides to go back to his father's house. He had lost and wasted everything and he found himself in a place where he wanted to go back to his father's house. And the Bible shares that the father's response of seeing his younger son come from afar was to run to him and hug him and, and throw him a big party and clothe him and celebrate the coming of his younger son coming back home. We pick up in Luke 11, 28 through 32, we then see the older son's response and this is what happens. The older brother became angry and, and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But then this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes, comes home. You kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because his, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is now found. You see, what the older brother had allowed to creep into his heart is the, the temptation of applause and praise. He was pointing at all the outside praise and applause that his father was giving to his younger son, when in reality, the older son had access to his father the whole time. He had forgotten that his father's love is enough and that the applause of people and the praise was not what defined him. So Revive Church, the antidote, what is it? It's to know that we are cherished and loved by God. And what could a human applaud add to that? That the love of God is enough. So church, would we submit the temptation of applause to God? and remind ourselves that no human applause and no human praise can ever truly satisfy us. That the greatest applause and the greatest praise that you can ever receive is knowing that you are His and that God's love is enough for you and for me. Let's pray. God, I, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that... Uh, that you're human, that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to live on earth for 33 years for us to get a glimpse of his humanity. And so God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you, God, that you give us glimpses of how he overcame temptation. My prayer today, God, is that you would search our hearts for any places in our lives where we have been tempted by applause where that has been our driving force, where that has become what we have, are living for. God, would you forgive us?
for losing sight of who we are in you, of knowing that we are fully loved and fully known by you, Jesus. God, would we submit those areas in our lives and would we place it in your hands and would you continue to challenge us and to guide us and to be more like you every single day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.